Recording starts. Again, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I want to thank the folks in the library who made the uh, the journey in. Uh, you'll be pleased to know they're all wearing masks and following our our protocols. 
Uh, we're hoping that the acoustics are better than the last meeting, uh, our May meeting. We've got some new equipment, but do let us know if you are having difficulty hearing. Uh, we're, we'll now move to our uh, moment in history, and I'm going to ask Gary to introduce our speaker. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good, good. One day we're going to see our speakers in that film that we just saw. Um, Dr. John Mopin is an outstanding uh, individual in the healthcare executive. He has been doing that for over 40 years. He's a senior advisor to population health, a provider-led community-based comprehensive health delivery system. He has been the president of Morehouse School of Medicine for eight years. He was the president of Mahari uh, Medical College for 12 years. He's the first um, alumnus to be the president of the school and also named uh, President Emeritus. He has spoken before Congress and the House of Representatives. He is a director on multiple boards. I can't even read them all, they're so long. But he's also with the uh, West Coast Black Theater. He's a director there. He's a director on the Van Weasel Foundation. Um, he, he has done everything. Um, the most important thing is a member of Make a Sci Fi, but that's, you know. <laughs> <laughs> He attended San Jose um, State University, Meharry College, Loyola University, where he got his MBA. And the most important thing is that he is a devoted husband, father, grandfather, and great grandfather. We should all know that his, his presentation is aligned with the annual meeting for Asala that's coming up next week. Black Health and Wellness. I give you now John Mopin. John. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And most of all, thank you for inviting me to join you in this very special um, reopening of your sessions after all of the COVID lockdown. And I know it's, I know you're glad to be able to get back together. And um, though some of those of you who are in person at the library and for those uh, that you had the summer break, um, now, let me just start off by saying a couple of things. I got the message, this is a moment in history, not a long history uh, course or lecture. Um, but I told Gary, I said, you know, you give me about 15 minutes. I said, it takes a black college president and a Baptist preacher about 15 minutes to get started uh, before they uh, begin to uh, share with you their important points. But I, I will try to uh, share with you a few, a few thoughts this morning uh, again, this is perfectly in line, and, and Gary, thank you for those kind remarks about uh, my, I, I've summarized my own successes in one way. I'm a very, very blessed person who had an awful lot of mentors and support along the way, and uh, they opened some doors, and, and I tried to make them proud as I walked through them. Um, let your, your conference starts off with a very important conversation, and it says, in order to foster good health and wellness, Black people have embarked on self-determination, mutual aid, and social support initiatives to build hospitals and medical schools and nursing schools. This is a part, a part of our history. So let's, with that in mind, let's take a little journey back in time to the 19th century, for the, where, for the, where the most part, medical schools were for whites only with few exceptions. In fact, it was not until 1847 that the first African-American medical student graduated from a US medical school, Dr. David Peck, who graduated from Rush Medical School in Chicago. In 1849, Bowdoin Medical School in Maine awarded medical degrees to John DeGrasse and Thomas White. And by 19, 1860, there were nine Northern medical schools that admitted black students. And by 1895, there were, there were, there were eight, 385 African-American doctors. However, only 27 of them uh, graduated from white medical schools. I'm gonna share with you a slide because I wanna go through and I, we don't have time to really 
spend um, as much time as, as probably would be could be used and bear with me as I try to get this uh, sharing up. Um, sorry to take this, this time away from my, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. All right, I'm gonna try to make sure I keep me over here and the presentation to the right side. Is that is that big enough? Can you see that is okay? It's, a, it's just a title page there. So by from 18, 1868 to 1902, we had 13 medical schools established. Now there's a lot of debate about how many medical schools were really established. And so there, there are different definitions. Some of them were medical programs and departments. Some of them had some, some minor training, some of them, uh, but, but those which we considered to be fully established uh, my, my records show, and, and a couple of the National Medical Association produced this list in one of its historical documents, that there were 13 of these schools established from 1868 to 1902. All of them focused on what we focus on today, health disparities and lack of access to quality care. And they all focused on one of the, what they believe was one of the most under, uh, important at, parts of that endeavor, and that is to produce physicians who looked like the people they will serve. And so all of these schools began uh, through, this, through this period. Unfortunately, unfortunately, and I could spend a whole time period with you talking about how each of them were established. I know that story of Meharry Medical College so well, uh, of course, having been a graduate and, and been there uh, during as its president for 12 years. Uh, that's a story that talks about a need, a public health need, because Nashville was suffering from smallpox. And so they started the school really not just to help Blacks, but to keep the entire community from being um, uh, inundated with poor health because of smallpox and the, and the United Methodist Church started. Each of these schools has their own story that we could talk about at, in, in an extended period of time. But they continued to exist and help to produce the doctors of the day and serve the communities of the day. However, by 1915, only two of them remained open, Howard University College of Medicine and Meharry Medical College. And of course, these two are still open today and operating. Now, there was a, young, a woman by the name of Dr. Anita um, uh, Moncrees from Wayne State University School of Medicine and a historian for the historical Hartford Memorial Baptist Church in Detroit, Michigan. And she attributes the closing of, of all of the other schools to four factors. She says it was funding, facilities, faculty, and the Flexner Report. The black medical schools lacked funding, like uh, funding from white benefactors that helped to provide the financial resources required. Many of the schools didn't have the appropriate equipment or facility resources to help students act adequately. They also did not have enough teachers to meet academic requirements, forcing them to close. However, the Flexner Report was the primary factor in this closure. The primary factor in this closure. Primary factor in this closure. Let me speak, so now we have four, but let me speak, uh, I brought that slide up a little too soon. Let me speak a little bit about the, uh, the Flexner Report, the impact of that report. The impact of that report was pretty clear. Now the Flexner Report came about in 1904. The Council of Medical Education was created. Uh, let me take this off because I like just talking to you. So let me stop sharing for a moment and just speak to you and I'll get back to that. Um, in 1904, the Council of Medical Education was created and by the American Medical Association to conduct a review of all of the schools. And they, they hired this medical theorist named Abraham Flexner. And, then, and Abraham Flexner surveyed all the schools across the country. He closed many white schools, but he also disproportionately closed almost all of the, of the 13 black schools. Uh, and, and actually by that time, the Flexner report there were about seven or eight schools of that 13 that were active, but, but those schools also all became, were closed. And what's important about this Flexner report, it, it, was, it, was, it was not just about closing those schools and saying who should be open, 
It was also noteworthy that Flexner argued that black physicians should serve as sanitarians and hygienists for black communities. And that black, and that black doctors should only treat black patients and should serve roles subservient to white physicians. Now you see, while the Flexner report ushered in an era of high standards for medical education, it also reinforced structure of exclusion of African-Americans from medical education and its negative impact was felt for decades. Now during the latter half of the 20th, uh, latter half of the, of the, uh, of the 20th, 20th century, we were able to then open up other schools. And so you find that, that, that uh, Drew Medical Center out in, and let me bring this back up for you, Drew Medical Center in, in Los Angeles. As a result of the 1968 riots, the County of Los Angeles decided to start the Martin Luther King Hospital. Out of that hospital came the uh, Drew, uh, Drew, Drew, Med Drew, I'm sorry, the Martin Luther King Hospital Center, but it also start, became uh, the Drew um, undergraduate program for medical education and its graduate programs. And the hospital offered a number of residency programs and fellowships. That helped to satisfy much of the desire for not only primary care doctors and generalists that were coming out of Howard and Meharry, but also offered residency programs. Unfortunately, of course, as the later years drew closed, but the medical school, the medical program continued. The Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science continues to this day. It has an affiliation with UCLA. It actually offers its medical degree from UCLA. Uh, and it, it has its basic science education at UCLA, and then its clinical training of medical students occurs at the various county hospitals in Los Angeles under the auspice of the, of the college. And in 1975, Morehouse College started its Morehouse College uh, program, a pre-med program, and then it became a two-year medical school doing basic science and sending students to other medical schools for the medical degree. In 1981, Morehouse School of Medicine was created, separating from the college as an independent school and being, uh, and being awarded um, its accreditation to offer the MD degree in 1975. Now, over the years, we've seen a lot of work, a report that came out by the Sullivan Commission talk about missing persons, minorities in the health professions. It highlighted the stagnation and the imbalance and diversity of physicians across the country. And it ushered in a period of, of greater emphasis on diversity and many schools began to create programs. However, despite decades of targeted programs and advocacy, numerous diversity and numerous diversity initiatives and even larger class sizes over the last several years, minorities are still vastly underrepresented among medical students, physicians, medical school faculty of all ranks. Our four historically black medical schools remain an irreplaceable national resource and vital component of the American medical education, serving as beacons of hope for the black community and vulnerable populations. The struggle continues. What I am hopeful about is that we have some hope in the future. The HBCU medical schools on the horizon include Xavier, which recently announced it's entering a planning phase to establish a graduate school of health sciences and medical school offering doctor degrees in medicine and biomedical research. This adds to the current programs they have in pharmacy and public health and physician assistance. And Morgan State University in Baltimore announced that it's entering into a partnership with the Salud um, Group to establish an osteopathic medical school on its campus with planned opening in 2024 or maybe, maybe in 2025. And this would add to its current programs in nursing and public health. I, I share with you this brief moment um, of reflection. We have a lot to do. All of these schools, the two, the four that exist and the two that may happen in the future will continue to need our support and our understanding of their role. They've expanded greatly over the years through a lot of effort of the Association of Minority Health Profession Schools, but they stay at the forefront of producing primary care doctors, generalists, and other physicians and healthcare professionals, dentists and pharmacists and all and the like, and nurses that go into our communities to serve. 
and, and, and we need to continue to support them. And I hope this is a brief reflection and I hope I haven't talked too fast, but I know I'm about to run out of time. Gary, I, I hope I did okay for you. Let me stop sharing. You did, you did there wonderful. Any questions, I'd love to take them. If you uh, have questions. Gary, I think we've got we've got a couple of minutes for some questions. Thank you, Dr. Maupin. That's excellent. Any questions? I can't really see all of the hands, so please speak out if you have a question. Hearing or seeing none. I, I, again, I have a question. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Mary, uh, how do I get you? Could, uh, Marcia Kendall Smith, could you tell me the number of female uh, 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 doctors in training compared to the male at this point in time? About 60% female, 40% male. The challenge of the past has been we have lost a number of the, the number of black males applying to medical schools has continued to decline. And there are a number of initiatives that are now on board trying to increase the number. The pipeline actually starts in the undergraduate area, but it even goes further because we're not getting as many black males going off to college in the, graduate, in, in the undergraduate program. So we've got to start, I know Morehouse School of Medicine and those that are, others that are working, I know James Hildreth uh, at, at Meharry, as well as, as Valerie Montgomery Rice at Morehouse, they all have focused on how do we attract or get our pipeline programs going to expand uh, those issues. Uh, I know that one of the, one of the uh, Morehouse has just entered into a program uh, to expand its medical school class size, working with Common Spirit uh, Health System, a large uh, Catholic health, and health system across the country, hospital system. They're gonna expand their class size and try to double it their class size, one of their efforts is to increase the number of black males entering medical school. And it's, so it's been a real challenge across a number of areas. Uh, and I think that's what's also been a part of the efforts at both Xavier and, at, and the conversations that have happened at, at Morgan. Thank you. So, let me, I just want, if I've got 30 seconds, let me just, I wanna highlight, there's a new book out and, and I, sh I should have remembered the name of it, but it's about, it's about the um, Association of Minority Health Profession Schools. Um, it called, we call it AMPS. AMPS started in 1983. Uh, it was led by, by some giants, Lou Sullivan and many others out of the, uh, uh, along with Norm Francis from Xavier, uh, those presidents during the time, as well as, as many of those who have mentored me. But what they did was they started the association and the association became the voice in Washington to ensure that we had the survival of our historically black medical schools by, by getting legislation that helped to support their very special unique mission, which is to take care of poor people. So you had hospitals around them closed because they could not, they did not, they did not seek people who had higher pay. Um, they were trying to offer care to the indigent and uninsured and so we ended up with a lot of programs that it would take, a, uh, take me too long to describe, but that association was extremely vital and, and Dr. Sullivan and others, uh, I was a contributor to it, but uh, they wrote a book about, the, um, about that. I'll share it with you, uh, Gary, maybe you can distribute it to, to, to the members. Yes. Uh, I think it's a good reflection on, on what has happened over the years in terms of federal support for historically black medical schools, but federal support for initiatives. It was AMPS that helped pass the, it introduced the legislation. And I was a part of that, uh, in, that, that created what is now the, in, the, the Minority Health Institute at NIH, um, uh, Research Institute at NIH. And so there's funding that's been specifically focused on looking at diseases and health conditions that disproportionately impact African-Americans. That effort was, that effort to push the federal government into, into, into talking about things like health disparities and social determinants of health. That has been, that effort has been led by that association for years. More have gone, have, have joined that in that effort. And I think you're hearing more about it. And because of all of that, and I think COVID was also responsible recently to really share uh, the impact, the disproportionate impact and public policy decisions that made no sense 
um, putting a hospital in the wrong place in New York, um, uh, talking about the reason that Black people have more, more uh, COVID was because they have more disproportionate diseases. No, it's because they had working jobs that they couldn't separate. Uh, they had to go to work and they lived in crowd, more crowded conditions. So it was, there's a host of things that we still have a lot to do. And these schools help lead that fight. Their association does. And that's why I, can, I think that we have to continue to, while there are other schools that will in fact help train the next generation of healthcare professionals, we can never let these four schools and if two more come on the six schools, we can never let those schools die. We I think Fran Taylor has a question. No, Fran Taylor has a question. Not or Fran, Ray. Ray. <laughs> Let me talk for a change. Uh, quickly, <laughs> if I may comment, uh, Dr. Malpin, uh, we have the same flip-flop in, in uh, dentistry regarding females uh, now being the uh, majority. Another problem is that Black dentists have the lowest net income and the highest debt when they finish. The average black dentist owes uh, approximately $308,000 when he graduates. And it's hard to attract young males, telling them they're gonna come out with the highest debt and the lowest income. That's all I have to say. No, very, very true, very true. I, I didn't wanna get into, I mean, these topics that we are touching on, um, we could spend a lot of time on each segment of these discussions, uh, whether, it's in, whether it's physicians. I've spoken mostly about the medical schools, I haven't talked about. I'm a dentist, of course, and they're public health. I mentioned how some of the other schools have a lot of other programs. Our, our issues are gonna be having the right health providers across the board uh, to address the health, the, disparate, the, the desperate, the disparate issues of health that we must address. And, and uh, the cost of healthcare, it, black enrollment increased in one year at one school when they, when they, when they eliminated tuition. Um, because black, black students go where they can, where they, because they know they can't afford it. Um, so whether it's dentistry or medicine or nursing, physician assistants, biomedical research, uh, pharmacy, veterinary, we, we, need, we, need, we, need, we need our share of people to look out for our community in each of those areas of health sciences. Excellent. Gary, I'm gonna hand it back to you. I don't see any okay. other hands. Well, no more hands, no more questions. Um, I want to thank John for taking his time out. He has other meetings to go to. Um, and thank him and hope he has a good day next Monday playing golf. Um, John, thank you so much. It was a great presentation. And I'm not physically in Florida right now. So your presentation will be received when I get back. <laughs> okay, thank you. Again, Thanks, thank John. you for Thanks, inviting Gary. me. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult topic to just touch on, but for a brief moment, we got, we, I think may have hopefully it stimulated some thought to read more uh, and, and more perspective of where we're headed in healthcare. And I really hope that uh, the efforts, uh, my, my wish to all of you is, is that uh, our community finally adopts a culture of optimal health, mind, body, and spirit. Mind, body, and spirit, Excellent. and culture of Excellent. how we live. Thank, Thank you, John. I look in, forward indeed. to getting that book, John. I look forward to getting your book. So, take care. Well, thanks, John. All right, I, thanks. I said to uh, Gary when when he told us that, that uh, Dr. Maupin was going to be our first speaker uh, as our meetings resumed, it couldn't have been more timely. Again, given uh, our uh, annual meeting and conference and, and its theme. So you'll hear more about that later. But let me get into our agenda as quickly as I can, see if I can do as good a job as, uh, as John did. Uh, my report, uh, I wanna begin with uh, Corrine Richardson and ask her to present our 2023-2024 uh, slate of Asala officers. Corrine, if you would. Uh, unmute, unmute yourself, Corrine, uh, there you go, thank you. Get out of the way. <laughs> I should be left-handed. Yes, left-handed. Can she hear? Yeah. 
can't hear. Can she? Is she? You still muted? Are you still muted? Yeah, I'm we muted. can't hear her. Can't hear you. Okay. Oh, there you are. All right. Okay. Great. Sorry about that. I'm trying really hard. Good morning, everyone. Um, Good morning. I would like to present the uh, slate of officers for 2023 and 2024. President David Wilkins, Vice First Vice President Harold Young, Second Vice President Rita Smith, Recording Secretary Frederick White, Corresponding Secretary David Harrelson, Treasurer Ray Bill, I'm sorry, Bix, Financial Secretary Felicia Jett. Historian Edna Shirell, members at large Robert Cantono, Mike Weddle, Education Committee Chairs Linda and Jean Crump, Scholarship Committee Chair Harriet Cowan, Arts and Culture Co Chairs, that is vacant right now. Uh, the slate is submitted by the nomination committee, Corrine Richardson Chair, Constance Anderson, Irene Hill, Lois Watson left us, so her name should not be on this. Thank you very much. <laughs> Corrine, thank you very much. We'll be certain that Lois gets that message. Uh, I, I, I do want to remind our membership uh, our bylaws provide uh, for this committee and the work, the great work they've done. I thank them for that. Uh, we will present this slate again in uh, October, uh, once again in November, and then we'll vote in November. And that group of officers will uh, take office in uh, January. Mm -hmm. Thanks again, Corrine. The You're rest welcome. of my report, very quickly, um, I we've taken our our summer break, but the board has been very active. Uh, don't know whether you know uh, these folks, uh, whether they're in town or summering someplace outside of Sarasota, have faithfully logged in and, and done a marvelous job. So I wanna begin by thanking them for that. Some of the things that we worked on, some of the issues hopefully you saw in our communications, uh, the uh, Community Foundation Agency Endowment Fund that we created. Some of you have contributed to that, and uh, we appreciate it. Uh, the Beyond Black History Month programs, which you'll hear more about uh, during the Education Committee report, have continued through the summer, will continue. Uh, again, that, that's a monthly program uh, that, that if you've missed, please go to our website because uh, you have indeed missed some, some very excellent programming. We're planning a Christmas breakfast, which you'll hear about, working on a Randy Rankin, hopefully for this year. Uh, the Give 828 uh, campaign, which we entered for the first time this year very successfully. And thanks to all of you who, who uh, gave to that program. We're planning a welcome back reception, which you will hear more about. And the Florida Coalition uh, team met and you'll hear more about them in a moment as well. So I just want you to not lose sight of the fact that uh, your board has been busy over the summer. The next item on my report is the national Asala dues increase. Uh, I believe all of our members uh, received Dr. Delaney's uh, email. Uh, if you've not, it is in your email, should be. Uh, which outlines the rationale for the dues increase. You'll get more specifics uh, from us on the, and Marion might have this, so oh, I don't need to show the, the letter. You'll, you'll get a specific email from us. We are not increasing our local dues because of programs like 828, we believe uh, we don't need to do that. National, and you'll read their rationale that's also in Dr. Delaney's letter. So just want you to be aware of that. Uh, Rita uh, will hopefully join us this morning and talk about our membership campaign, which, which is underway, really will kick off in October. And so we need you to know about that, that dues increase so nobody is, is taken by surprise. 
the um, I mentioned the the annual meeting and conference uh, beginning next week in Montgomery. There are twelve or fourteen of our Minnesota Asylum members uh, planning to attend uh, to participate. Uh, that is a in person and virtual conference. I, I would encourage those of you who can't make it to Montgomery. Uh, and, and I hope you have all gotten, you probably gotten more emails on, on this conference than you would have liked, uh, but, but please check it out. Uh, Dr. Maupin kicked us off in fine fashion, and there, there are just wonderful programs, uh, again, that you can take part in virtually. Let me emphasize, uh, at the annual awards uh, banquet, which I believe is Saturday night, Jim Stewart is going to receive uh, the living leg a living legend award. I'm, I hope I'm using the right term. And um, so, so for those of you who are going to be in Montgomery, hopefully you can be there and support Jim and Carol. The second item under our conference is uh, we will have uh, two of our members actually presenting a panel discussion. So this is Trevor Harvey, who is the NAACP president. Many of you know Trevor and Bill Woodson who is at New College, uh, Bill, Bill's, I should say, his doctoral thesis uh, is linked to this, uh, this panel discussion that will happen on, I believe it is Saturday afternoon. It is entitled Innovation Through Collaboration, Sarasota Pursues a Novel Approach to Excellence in Community Policing. Joining Trevor and Bill on that panel will be the chief of police for Sarasota, uh, Troc, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, it's T-R-O-C-H, and a police captain. So the four of them are going to present a panel, and, and it's not often that we're able to, uh, as the branch, present a panel. Uh, those of us who are going to be there will certainly be supportive and be encouraging everybody we know to, to overwhelm that, that conference room. So Thanks to, to Trevor and, and Bill for that contribution. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the, I mentioned the Florida Coalition, and in your meeting notice, you would have seen a memorandum. And I just wanted to emphasize, again, the Florida Coalition is made up of the six branches, and, and the six branches have been focused since actually the passage of HB7, which is DeSantis's so-called Stop Woke Act, uh, on how do we support our students and teachers in the teaching of our history. Uh, the Florida Coalition made a proposal to the Asala, National Asala Strategic Planning Committee. That proposal, and in its five or six elements, was unanimously approved last Saturday. So that's work coming out of not just Minnesota Asala, but the Florida Coalition of Branches. And so I'd encourage you to read that memo. I'd encourage you more so to get involved in this fight. Uh, some of us are reviewing a program, uh, a curriculum program that we might be able to use to supplement what's what's obviously not going to be taught now in our schools because of this, this attack on the teaching of our history. So we need Asala, Minnesota Asala members, as, as we're asking all of the Asala members to get involved to ensure that our children and our communities continue to preserve, uh, to promote, uh, to research, to disseminate, interpret uh, information about African and African Americans consistent with our mission. So. Um, let me stop there. That's my report. I think I've covered everything. And let me ask Alan to present his treasures report. And Alan, I've got your slides, I believe. You're muted, Alan. Okay, no longer. Okay, good. All right. Balance sheet or PL? Well, let's do the balance sheet. That's the most fun. <laughs> Can you see it? Yes. Can everybody see the balance sheet? I want to start by stating that we changed our financial reports to make them more user friendly and to answer four basic questions. Where does the money come from? What do we do with the money? 
what do we keep? And most importantly, what's next? So if you look at the balance sheet, we'll go through this fairly briefly and just go through the highlights. The assets are what we have on hand, divided between checking account, savings account, and total investments. Each one of these items is explained at the bottom of the sheet. So basically our financial position, our total wealth, if you have it, if you will, was 148,893.79. But it's really more important to see how we actually break that out between what we spend now, what we might spend in the future. So if you look at the sheet below that, the fund balance is unrestricted. Basically we can spend this money without anything except for a justification by somebody who wants to spend the money. This is our money to spend for ongoing business expenses. The other numbers below that restricted are very specifically donated for a purpose. Endowment, $20,000, you may, may or may not know about this program, but four families gave money, uh, $5,000 each for an investment for the next four or five years. Again, that money cannot be touched for the next five years. Scholarship is ongoing. We know all about that from all the past fundraising. Our total scholarship balance is now $48,000. 360, we know we started that program back in December. And the film project that we've talked about before, we started with $130,000. The project is almost done. The film was shown last week at Ringling College. The remaining balance is $23,499 to be used for promotion, et cetera. So our total fund balance is 148,893, okay? More importantly, if you look below, you see the investments have very specific designations. Agency fund we just talked about and 11th month, certificate of deposit. Again, our purpose was to make this statement much more self-explanatory and more self-directed. Any questions on the balance sheet? Again, basically, what do we have? Where uh, uh, Alan, Lynetta, Lynetta has a question, uh, Alan. Yes, ab absolutely. Where was the film shown? I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear what you said. The completed film. The, the Watson film? Yes. I was shown last week at Ringling College. So they're going to show it again. David, can you talk about that event where they're going to actually show it again at, at the Watson's farewell uh, ceremony? Yeah, the, the film was shown to a small group to approve the final cut. They're planning an event in November. Uh, I'll find the date, uh, but it'll be at Ringling and we'll get more information out. That, that is literally happening as we speak. There's a committee formed. Um, Bob Fitz. Gerald uh, is co-chairing with uh, Christine Jennings. So there'll be more information out about that. Thank you, Lynetta. Alan, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, any questions on the balance sheet before we move on? Again, it's to basically answer the questions, where did the money come from? What do we do with it? What do we keep? And hopefully give you an idea of what's gonna happen next with our funds. So that's our basic um, balance sheet. The next statement is the already familiar profit and loss statement. Couple of items to highlight here. If you look at the month of August, the main event there was the expenditures for scholarships of $10,000. A bottom line reflects that. If you go to the year of the date, our number there is 4722. We typically end the year at around positive 15,000. So most of our scholarship spending is done. We expect to be slightly positive before the end of the year. And again, our purpose, and please give me any ideas that you may have, is making the statements more user-friendly and easy to follow. And that completes my report. Excellent, Alan. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing and see if there are any questions for Alan. Seeing no hands raised, the Alan's report will be uh, received subject to any corrections or additions. I sh should have also mentioned minutes from May. If you remember, May is always our scholarship uh, celebration. That really was our our uh, program for May. It was a wonderful program, but we, we're not submitting any uh, minutes. We have a recording of that. If anybody missed it and would like to see it, uh, let us know that's available to us, to us. All right, Alan, thank you. Rita Smith is traveling, our membership chair. Uh, she told me if, I, I do see her. <laughs> Rita, you're- Good morning. There you are. Good morning, yeah, Rita. I'm, uh, She's I'm moving. actually in a subway in Atlanta. <laughs> But um, anyway, I uh, just wanted to say hello to all of our members and looking forward to our new uh, membership renewal campaign. Um, as David said, we do have a little increase, but I'm sure we'll be able to get through it. So um, 
Hold on one minute, David. I'm sorry. I'm no, no, you're fine. Find you're my fine. way in here. But um, we've all been stuck in the subway. <laughs> but anyway, um, again, uh, we welcome our new members to renew uh, doing a membership renewal campaign starting October 1st, going through the end of uh, November. And of course, the memberships will be effective as of January 1st. Uh, does anyone have any questions about the whole renewal process? Rita, you're going to have a uh, campaign email, I believe the 27th will be published. Yes. So yes. We'll be able to see the specifics. Yes. Online. It will be online. Yeah, enrollment. We've already got some members who have, have uh, enrolled. So, uh, Rita, if you don't have anything else, I'm going to let you uh, go so you can watch where you're walking. Okay. Uh, the subway's a dangerous place to be looking at your phone. So, yes, uh, and I, I can't, I can't thank the membership committee enough. Uh, they worked so hard last year. We've got um, more than 400 members, and uh, we hope to to continue growing that membership through the work of uh, Rita and her committee. So, uh, be safe, Rita. Thank you for for dialing in. Marion, okay. our correspondent. Anything else, Rita? Thank you. Marion, okay. correspondence. I mean, I'll already think they are. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are planning a holiday breakfast uh, on December 3rd, and uh, the communication for that will go out on the 19th of October, after our welcome back uh, committee, our welcome back event. So uh, we're really excited about it. It's going to be at the Grove in uh, Lakewood Ranch uh, in Bradenton. So we want to make sure that everybody knows about it. We'll send out communications. We'll also send out a mailing uh, to let you know, because every year when we have the breakfast, we have fewer seats than people who want to attend. So we're asking as soon as you receive that communication, you'll go online and you'll be able to uh, register and buy tickets for that event. Uh, please don't delay starting on the 19th. The link will be available, go online and buy your tickets. You can buy a table. Uh, you can buy individual tickets for our holiday breakfast. Okay, anybody have any questions for me? Marion, what's the date again? December 3rd. I'm gonna try to check it. Uh, $65 and we will have WBTT while we'll be there uh, for our entertainment. Marion, December 3rd is a Saturday? Uh, December 3rd is a... Mm, look. look, I can't remember. It's a Saturday. It's a Saturday. 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 It's a Saturday. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, Levette. For many years uh, before this, there was a cutoff date for tickets to be purchased by Asala members. That was before it was made public. Asala members were able to buy their tickets. And then after we had reached our deadline, it was open to the public because there was never a facility that could hold everybody who wanted to attend, as you mentioned earlier. Yes. Are you going to have that this year to give the membership a chance? Well, I because we're selling them online, once the link becomes available, It'll be a first come first serve basis of members and non-members. I would like to ask that members have an opportunity before you put it online. Would you consider that? I'll consider it. Always done that. You will consider it. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, comments? capacity for the world. We have 300 uh, seats 
uh, 280 will be available to us because we have to allow um, seating for our WBTT guests as well. Any other questions? Tickets available now. Tickets are not available yet. They will be available on October 19th. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mary, and, and, and thank you, uh, Ms. Harper, for reminding us of that practice. Uh, October 19th, I'd encourage all of us to, to go online, buy your tickets, call your friends. Uh, the, the challenge we face is obviously uh, we can't limit once the, the link is open. So October 19th, and, and there'll be more communications uh, from, from Mary and from us about that. Um, I'm going to ask Bo Bell to uh, do his good and welfare report. He's got a meeting. I know he's got to get away at 1115. So Bo, if, I'm going to jump you ahead on the agenda so you can um, give us your report. There you go. Thanks, Bo. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Um, good. The, the saddest news that I have to report concerning the loss of uh, three of our members. One is uh, Phyllis White, who passed away uh, last month, and Leon Harris. And I just recently learned that Joan Bird passed away this week. So those are the members that uh, we have lost. I ask that you keep them in your prayers. We have a number of other members who are suffering from health challenges. Uh, Fred White is having some problem with uh, his eyes and he's been back and forth to the doctor a number of times trying to get that issue resolved. Don right. Frazier is having some problems with uh, uh, his health as well as Jim Cleves, who has been hospitalized for the last month. Uh, Wanda Gilbert has contacted COVID, and she seems to be doing pretty well, however. Uh, Mark Jackson was recently hospitalized, and Herman Gilbert has contacted COVID, as well as Larry Miller and Sheldon Waxman. Uh, I ask that you continue to pray for each and every one of these members. Each one of the ones that I've called have been sent either goodwill cards or uh, condolences to the families. And that's the end of my report, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Bo, very much. And uh, we'll keep all of those names in our thoughts and prayers. Uh, COVID is not gone away, as some people would like us to believe. And again, I thank the folks in the room here for masking and socially distancing. And I know everybody is uh, um, inoculated. Lois and I got our third booster this past week, and um, we're, we're grateful for it. So thank you, Bo. Let's move to our committee reports. And let me begin with uh, Paul, Paul Tolliver on arts and culture. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair and members. Brief report today. Our uh, primary objective of the Arts and Culture Committee this year is to recruit new chairpersons for the committee. We're gonna do an active outreach uh, among the memberships to see who's interested, who's willing to step up. Uh, as you know, in the past, it's been myself and uh, Mr. Willie Clemens. Uh, we started in, in the position about four years ago. So basically we were kind of terming out uh, on, on the committee. So we'll do an active recruitment, active outreach, and we'll work with our corresponding uh, secretary and try to reach out. The other, other short uh, information, the committee, we will be meeting uh, this week with the Hermitage uh, about a uh, future collaboration with their programs for the next year coming up. So 
we'll be meeting with them about what they have on their agenda and where we can collaborate. So that's the type of thing that the, the chair and the committee members will be engaged in for those who will be part of that committee. Uh, so are there any questions right now? All right, see any all questions right. with, with the chair? Yeah. Oh, I see a hand. Yeah, right here, Mr. Paul. Mr. Box, Boxer. Hi, Paul. Would you kindly, as uh, you're involved in the SOL, remind everybody about the visions of the Black experience from the 8th to the 10th of November? Sounds good. One of the tasks is to be involved with a number of good organizations like the Boxer Institute. And uh, the uh, visions of the Black experience is the Black Film Festival. That is scheduled for this November uh, 10th, I think we kick off. Is that right? Eighth, no, 8th, 8th, 9th, and 10th. 8th, 9th, and 10th, uh, both live and uh, online. We will be doing live uh, screenings at uh, uh, the uh, Saner. Is that correct? Correct. And, and we will get information out, if not already out. Uh, to uh, to Asala as well as in general, but uh, a collection of hopefully anywhere from 25 to 40 film about the Black experience and a lot of local films as well. So that's coming up November 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th, and looking forward to seeing you there. Thank you, sir. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. And, and let me reiterate, we, we are in need of uh, chair or co-chair for our arts and culture committee. Uh, we have um, some members who want to work on the committee. Uh, they just at this time couldn't chair it. And so um, we will be reaching out. Uh, you know how important arts is to this community, uh, how important arts is to our community. And we want to uh, continue to grow our relationships. Uh, half of our institutional members are arts and culture related. So we, we do need to uh, emphasize this as much as we do our other committees. And I'm, I'm, I'm eternally grateful to Paul for his faithful leadership over these many years. And I know he's going to stay, while not chair, he'll stay involved in the work of our arts and culture uh, committee. Let me move to our scholarship, uh, or let me, let me do education in um, Jean and Linda first, um, our education committee. Morning, Jean. Morning, Linda. David, how are you? Good. Uh, the, the education committee just recently started its second year of our Beyond Black History Month uh, programs. And our first program this year was from the stars, from baseball to the stars. And our next one uh, is going to be uh, Odyssey to Africa. I think uh, Linda is chairing that program, and it's a program about uh, one of our members had a tour of uh, Africa uh, this past summer, Edna Shirell, and she's going to make a presentation on her excursion to Africa. Uh, we are looking for input, and we're looking for programs. Uh, for the rest of the year, I think in March and May. Uh, I think we're having a very big uh, kickoff for our uh, association with the Boxer Diversi Diversity Initiative about putting on an essay contest in conjunction with the Equal Justice Initiative. And it will be starting the, the 1st of October and it'll go through uh, December 15th. And we're asking high school students between the ninth grade and the 12th grade to submit an essay on the various topics that the EJI has listed. And the prizes are going to be from EJI $5,000 uh, to the winner or winners. And the uh, Box of Divers Diversity Initiative will sponsor a student or two to a trip for, for uh, the winner, winners uh, to Montgomery, Alabama to tour uh, the Legacy and Memorial Museum uh, put on by EJI. And I think, uh, not speaking for Lynn, I think the program is a success. 
but I'll let Linda add to uh, my uh, part of the report. I don't have much to add other than we do have a great intern again this year. We've been very fortunate as an education committee to also get some new members. And I'm just going to put a call out to the membership. Remember, there's always room to join one of the member one of the committees that's doing all this fabulous work. And the more people that volunteer, the lighter the load. So that's the only thing I'd add. It's been a great committee. We're having really great success. We'll turn it back over to David. Unless any, any questions or questions. comments? Uh, can I make an, another comment? Sorry to interfere, but um, this essay contest really needs your support because, as you know, with the new laws, uh, the, it's, I think it's HB seven. We cannot go through the high schools normally to disseminate information about this, so we are really reliant on all. Uh, organizations, allied organizations, so any way they can get the information to high school students. Uh, Gene and Linda have done an unbelievably good job in terms of organizing this. And I want to add, this isn't just Boxer Diversity Initiative, it's Asala is one of the partners, as well as Newtown Alive and the new uh, SAC uh, Center. So when you get the flyer and when you get the information, please, if you know, have any contacts with high school students, teachers, I beg you to help disseminate. Thank you. And Dan, please don't forget how important the Holistic Minnesota Remembers Project is because there will be a marker that will go up. There'll yep. be soil collection at some point. We're trying to find an intern to help with that more holistic program too. And Asala is part of all of that. So that's a lot of important work that's being done. David, another key component to the essay contest is embracing our differences. They have diversity clubs throughout Minnesota and, and Manatee and Sarasota. And we, we're enlisting them to help us get the word out to the high school students and they they're, they're lifting a heavy load to, to make this a success. So I want to call out embracing our differences and I'm embracing our differences right now. Thanks, Gene and, and Linda, and thank you, Dan. I'll add to the uh, comments around the Community Remembrance Project. As, as Linda said, it is uh, multifaceted, the essay contest uh, is is ready to go, and uh, our education committee has done a lot of work. We're looking for students, and and it is one of the ways we can continue to engage young people in our history, uh, this tragic aspect of our history, uh, and and again to counter the efforts of those who would who would seek to to squash that history. The marker, uh, I can tell you, uh, so. Again, there's the soil collection, there's the marker, uh, and there's the essay contest as three of the components. Uh, I attended a meeting last week arranged by Dan with the Unitarian Universalist Church, uh, an ally of Asala's, an ally of this important work. And their board is considering, and, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, Dan, but um, I think Brock Leach would give us give me license to do so. Their board is considering placing the marker uh, on, on church grounds. Uh, I hope you understand how significant that is if you also remember the controversy. Our original intent was to place this marker in Manatee proper, uh, close to where we believe one or more of our ancestors were lynched. Uh, given all of the poisonous environment around the last two years, uh, we've moved now to this, this newer plan, and, and I cannot tell you how encouraged I was by uh, what I heard from the head of the, the, the pastor of the church and his board, in essence, telling us we live our values. If you've not been past this church, this is the Unitarian Universalist Church on Fruitville, you would notice it immediately because they have a enormous Black Lives Matter sign posted on the outside of their church. It's been torn down twice and they continue to put it up. 
So these are folks who, as they said, we live our values and they're doing that and they're supporting this program. Many of us are going to be at e EJI next week as a part of the conference. Brian Stevenson will be speaking. I think he is the keynote speaker at one of the luncheons. So we'll have opportunities to update their staff on where uh, Dan and this team have led us uh, on this community remembrance project. So encourage you all to get involved in this if you've not been involved. Uh, Gene and Linda, if there's nothing else, uh, we'll move to our scholarship uh, report with Perry Count, who's with us this morning. Thank you, guys. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, checks have been sent out for the past recipients and um, for their freshman year, for the most part, some actually start in their junior year because they were dual enrolled. And so uh, we are going to be having our first committee meeting starting in November as we plan for the new applications, which will be due February 15th. Um, let's see, I wanted to say also that um, a small group uh, of us on the committee, we have started a mentoring program so that we are in touch with those students who had just received the scholarships and we're supporting them, guiding them, and they are really appreciative of it. I think it's very important to not only help them with their scholarship money, but also to uh, be there for them. Uh, with this mentoring program. So we're going to see how it works. We're starting out with just a few of us doing this, and so far it's been very well received. Uh, we've updated the website uh, on the slide presentation so that uh, with all that data that had been collected for 10 years, I've now updated it for the last two years. And so it's very interesting, and um, along with Dr. Maupin's, um statement about the majority of the uh, medical students and students who are going into STEM are women. And so that still rings true from what I could see for the past two years. Uh, I did want to also say that um, outside of our immediate scholarship program, we have become a needed resource for help. Uh, to some of our recipients um, this year who have expressed a need for additional help financially. And so I have to really acknowledge um, some of the committee members, two in particular, Ron Mason and Ron Klein, who really got us going on uh, reaching out to our friends, people in the community who could help um, three students in, in particular, one who was uh, ready to have to drop out of school because of the need for funds. Uh, this was all beside the scholarship money that had been provided. Another was a young woman who going on to Harvard who got into Harvard uh, borrowing a computer. She needed a computer. And so we were able to help her. And another young lady going to Ringling School of um, College Ringling College of School and Design, and someone from our organization, a member, was able to donate a very valuable um, camera. And so all of these kind of things means that we are reaching out, supporting these uh, young people who are pursuing their education, and it takes a village. And I think that's what we have going on. So we're very pleased to announce uh, the scholarship program is still going on. So thank you. Welcome back. And okay, David wanted me to mention the welcome back reception. And so that will be October 18th. It was very exciting to have that because it hasn't been going on for a couple of years because of the pandemic. And so um, it's going to be excitedly at the new Sarasota Art Museum um, on uh, 41. And um, it's going to be, let's see, October 18th from two to five. We will have a tour. We won't have to pay to get into uh, the museum. We will have a tour uh, at our free time. During that time, there will be some past uh, canapes, a cash bar uh, for any drinks that someone would like to have. 
and uh, we'll have a presentation also, presentation of of the music of the from the director about the museum uh, and how it got started and what it all the wonderful programs that are going on each week at that museum, as well as uh, someone from Ali uh, who uh, conducts the workshops. So that's gonna be an exciting welcome back. And the thing about it is we're limited with the number of people who can uh, come to the welcome back reception. And we hope that you, know, you will RSVP. And this is the best way that we've decided to do it for you to RSVP to this website, which uh, Marion will put on the chat. Um, info at asala Minnesota FL dot org. And uh, we're asking by October 12th, just about a week before it's going to start. Uh, so by October 12th, please RSVP that you will be attending so we can have a count for the museum director. So we look forward to seeing all of you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Harriet. And it, 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 lots going on. Obviously, our welcome back, our Christmas event, uh, resuming meetings. We'll meet here again in October, obviously, uh, in November. Um, any questions on anything so far? I've got to move to new business. I've got one item to share. Um, my wife just brought this in fresh off the print. So the friends of the Betty J. Johnson North Sarasota Public Library invite you to our library's 19th anniversary celebration and open house. Tuesday, October 4th, October 4th, 4.30 to 7.30 p.m. Uh, so watch watch for this. It'll be in our in our in uh, one of our upcoming newsletters, I'm sure, as a matter of uh, new business. Any other new business? as we wrap up our September meeting here. I look to our friends here in the audience, any other new, anything new to report? Any old business? Any, uh, any announcements? Yeah. David. Yes. Did you miss um, fundraising on the agenda? Um, so I thank you, uh, Fran. So Fred is obviously, he may still be in Cleveland, uh, the memorial for Phyllis uh, was, I believe, um, last Saturday. Uh, there's going to be a memorial here in uh, Sarasota. No date set yet. It's it's something that Fred is working on. Fred's obviously also our, I should say, not obvious, but our, our fundraising chair. Uh, were he here, he would thank all of us for uh, the cards and letters and prayers. Uh, we will miss Phyllis uh, terribly. Um, on the fundraising side, uh, I think Fred would want us to remember that the 360 uh, uh, fundraising program is ongoing. That was not just a one-time effort uh, to cover our COVID period, uh, but it was designed by Fred to be a very flexible uh, pay as you can, uh, whenever you can, uh, and and I think that link is still live on our website. So please remember the 360 uh, program. David, Thanks, you, Fran. Okay, go ahead, Fran. So um, soliciting for the um, endowment. Absolutely, absolutely, okay. uh, and that that was covered in one of our earlier emails. We'll be uh, touching on it again. We were trying. We're getting some feedback that people are uh, getting tired of seeing David Wilkins pop up in their email box, and I fully understand that. I'm going to start using somebody else's name for those communications because I don't want you coming to my house. Uh, but we do want to get, um, again, uh, information to you, and, and there is a lot of it. Uh, and Fran, thank you for reminding us. We will continue to refresh news about the the. Agency fund at the Community Foundation is open, receiving dollars, and um, that's our long-term investment plan. 360 is the plan to supplement whatever we can do on an annual basis to support our scholarship programs. And uh, we are going to, if, again, if Fred were here, he is, he is working with the team on a renewed Randy Rankin. Uh, you, you all know there's a number of things we haven't been able to do over the last couple of years, Randy Rankin being one. 
and your response uh, to support our scholarship program in lieu of Randy Rankin has uh, is just been always, always appreciated and tremendous. Um, I think I saw, did Gene have, uh, yes, Gene. Uh, <clears throat> this goes without saying, but all of our Beyond Black History Month programs are being recorded and they're listed on the uh, Asala webpage uh, as uh, an addition. And also I think they're on the announcement that goes out to the, to the uh, Asala audience, but they're, they're all important. They're very, very instrumental in understanding our history. So we don't uh, have bad repeats of our history, but uh, all of our programs are recorded and you can all see them. I know it's a hard time from the four to five time frame to get everybody involved. But if you can't come to the program, you can always uh, see it online. Thanks, Gene. Gene, didn't you also tell me that, and this relates to, again, the, the upcoming conference and annual meeting, for those who want to participate virtually, it's correct that some of those programs are open to the public. Is that right? I mean, you, don't, you don't have to to pay for some of these that you might want to do virtually. Is that yes. correct, Gene? Can we do mm -hmm. some research on that? Yes. Okay. All right. And um, Marion has just handed me a Meet the Quilters, Thursday, October 13th, five to six. Is this in our newsletter or will it be? All right, October five to six, come meet some of the, and, and you'll see some of the quilts behind us. Linda, I don't know if either of these are, are one of yours. One is. One, all right, but the, the, the room is surrounded. You all should be here. They're beautiful and they're all over the library and they are up until when? Uh, Linda, do you know? I think the 22nd of October. Okay, and I think Erin is on here, so she might know. Uh, but do come by Betty Johnson and see these quilts. Uh, they are beautiful. Uh, this quilting program. Correct, that you, Aaron, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, the 22nd is correct, October. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Erin. Um, come meet some of the talented and creative quilters of the Friendship Not Quilters Guild and Sarasota Modern Quilt Guild. Um, again, Thursday, October thirteenth, five to six. Look for this in our in our new in our next newsletter, probably. Any other announcements? Yes, Linda. You know, it's just uh, let's all be safe. It looks like this Ian Storm wants to come and join us here on this part of Florida. Some of us won't be in town, but please just be safe and do what's smart. Thanks, Linda. Indeed, indeed. I don't see any other hands, um, and I would ask for a um, a, 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 um, a motion to adjourn. Since Bob usually does that, I will move to adjourn. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Linda. I'm going to stop the recording. It's good, good to see you all. I'll leave the Zoom open. Uh, I see some faces here. Uh, we might want to uh, see the Johnsons. We haven't seen them in a while, and they both look well. Uh, the Gibbs as well. It's Jerry. We haven't seen her in a while. And the Hills are on. Hope to see you all in Sarasota soon. It's not no. I'm, I'm tired of looking at my friends on this and uh, this little computer box. <laughs> we want to give you a we want to give you a hug. We, we hope to be down there. Stop soon. the recording. There. <laughs>